Good morning, church family and ministry friends. This is Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to our online internet around the world church service. And I'm so glad that you are here today. Now, before we jump into today's message, let's first honor the Lord by receiving the tithes and offerings. And I would like to read something very special that will bless you financially from the book of Genesis chapter 14. And let's drop down to verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him. In other words, he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that would be Abram, gave him, that would be Melchizedek, a tithe of all. Woo! My friends, Abraham was a committed tither. And tithing is the number one obligation in the covenant of prosperity. Woo! Praise God. Well, Pastor Stephen, why would that be so? Because tithing is the key to an open heaven life of blessing. And we see this, of course, in the book of Malachi, that would be chapter 3, and one of the verses is verse 10, speaking of the blessings of the tithe. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Well, my friends, God gives you ten and he expects one to come back to him in return. Woo, praise God. And so, until you get engaged in the tithing covenant, the blessing channel is disconnected from the believer. It doesn't matter how much they shout, holler, and how many uh, poems they write, how many songs they sing to Jesus. You've got to get involved in the financial covenant through the act of obedience of tithing. Praise God. Glory to God. Now, Abraham, of course, was a tither and a liberal giver. So if we are Abraham's children, which we are, then we should do what? We should do the works of Abraham, just like Jesus said we should in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. And he said this in verse 39. Mm -mm. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Wow. You know, God revealed himself to Abraham as being Jehovah Jireh, the God of provision, the, uh, literally in the Hebrew, the God who will see to it that your every need is met. And back in the 80s, there was a song came out uh, called Jehovah Jireh. And many people shouted and danced and uh, would da dance all around the church singing Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me, you know, and really get into it and, uh, you know, jump extra high when singing it. And still, a year later, nothing's changed financially. <laughs> hey, where's Jehovah Jireh? <laughs> well, there's conditions to be met. And Abraham met those conditions. And if we want the blessings of Abraham to be ours, there was another song. The blessings of Abraham are mine. And you could sing that song and then turn it right around and not do the works of Abraham and thus disconnect yourself from the blessings. Mm -hmm. Wow. So tithing is the gateway to kingdom prosperity. And if you're not a tither, then you don't have that golden key to prosperity. Woo! Wow. Well, let's go back to the book of Genesis very briefly. Uh, Genesis chapter 22. Uh, heavyweight scripture coming up here. Let me jump over there. There we are, Genesis 22. And this is verse 16 all the way through 18. And said, by myself I have sworn... I mean, this is an oath. Says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you. 
and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, talking about Abraham, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Wow. Now, this, my friends, is where God swore blessings that all the forces of the enemy upon the face of the earth cannot stop it. I mean, this is a sworn blessed covenant. Mm-mm. And by the way, Israel is an unbeatable nation because they are uh, direct descendant of the seed of Abraham, the Jewish people. Mm-mm. And you might win a battle against them, but you're never, ever going to win the overall war, war ever, ever against Israel. Israel can never, ever be defeated. And I'm so happy to say that. <laughs> Why? There's a powerful, powerful covering over that nation. And even with their mistakes that they can make and sometimes do, even with the uh, various forms of sin that are within that nation, and there certainly are quite a few of them, but nevertheless, God has made a covenant of blessing with Abraham that comes down through that line and touches the modern day nation of Israel and the, the Jewish people. Praise God. Because you know what? You can't ignore the Jews on the whole planet. There's only like 7.5 million of them, but yet their contributions to science and aviation and aeronautics and agricultural uh, and technology and various other areas, they are uh, world pace leaders. Woo, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Such a small group making such a major global impact. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Mm -mm. Because of a strong covenant through Abraham's offering of sacrifice, that covenant was cut. God swore. Well, Pastor Stephen, I'd like to get tied into that covenant. Well, if you want to get into the financial covenant, that area of financial blessing, You have to honor God, first of all, beginning with the tithe. He gives you 10. All he's asking for is one. (laughs) That gets you in on the, uh, the covenant blessing. And then, of course, you can also give offerings. And you can even... You could even come into times like Abraham where there is the giving of a sacrificial offering. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. So every time God makes a financial demand on you to give, let's say, uh, like a sacrificial offering, it's because he's got something, something very special reserved for you. So there's tithing that gets you into the financial covenant. There's the giving of offerings. See, God told this people in Malachi, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. What is an offering? Anything above the 10%. The tithe belongs to God. So there's the tithe that gets you into the financial covenant that opens the windows of heaven. Offerings determine what's poured through those windows, okay? And then there's sacrificial Uh, type offerings that can be given during very special times in your life. We would call it the breaking of the alabaster jar. Uh, Abraham identified it as being God requiring the sacrifice of his one and only son, the son of promise. And he was willing to do it, endeavor to actually do it. (laughs) Uh, So praise God. God swore a blessing. Mm -mm. You know, I believe that one day soon, that the tithe that you give will be greater than what your current annual salary is. I mean, we're in, we're in tax season. Now, the ministry taxes, all of that is done. We're tax exempt, but that doesn't mean we don't have to file paperwork. Our, our paperwork uh, for the ministry is about that thick, <laughs> maybe thicker, <laughs> but it's all done. Everything's in ship shape. And uh, personal taxes for my wife and I all filed also. Everything's done. But you know how much money you made last year, okay? If not, you're going to find out in a few days because you've got to get the taxes done. But I believe that one day, and I believe it with all of my heart, uh, 
I believe one day very, very soon, your tithe will be more than your current annual salary. Mark it down. Mark it down and watch what God's going to do as you honor him, not dishonor him, but as you honor him with your finances and give him the tithe, and then you sow seed, you give offerings, and then then you could have a uh, one of those special moments where you give the alabaster box, you break it like Mary Magdalene did, or like how God spoke to Abraham, hey, I'm calling for that right there. What, what Lord? Uh, your, your son. <laughs> okay? And th- those things release a tremendous, tremendous blessing. So come on in to the Abrahamic order of blessing. Oh, glory to God. Woo! Get off the stingy old relig- religious, greedy, poverty-embracing system and get over into God's biblical system of prosperity which is tied to walking in the Abrahamic order of blessings. Come on, today, emulate your spiritual forefather Abraham and be a tither and be a giver and be a very gracious giver and watch what God does for you. Watch what God does for you as you walk, uh, as you do the works of Abraham, you walk in the blessings of Abraham. Now, having said those things, Let's now honor God. Let's be hearers and doers of the word. Let's honor God and bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse of the Lord. Right now, I'm putting up on the screen how you can give. Now, if you want to mail in your tithe and your offering, you can send it to Stephen Brooks International, P.O. Box 717, Moravian Falls, North Carolina. The zip code here is 28654. Now, of course, if you want to bring your tithe and offering in online, you can do so from anywhere in the world, as long as you can jump on the internet, push a few buttons, okay? Go to stephenbrooks.org. That's our website. Look up at the top. There's a header that says, Give Online. Click that. It'll drop down. It'll say Tithes and Offerings. Click that. It takes you to the giving page. And there, you'll see the word F-U-N-D. Click the word fund. It brings the drop-down menu. There's the area for the tithe. There's the area for the offering. There's even special projects we're working on. Mm -hmm. And you can sow as the Holy Spirit leads you. Praise God. Praise God forever. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I pray over the tithes and offerings of your people as you're bringing them now into the storehouse. I thank you that they will know overflow. They will know what it is to be in the overflow. Every bill paid, every need met. Operating in the financial covenant. Practitioners of the Abrahamic covenant. Woo! Honoring you with the tithe. Father, we thank you that Jesus is still the high priest, the great high priest, that Melchizedek was a shadow of the great Messiah that would one day come. And we thank you that even as Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 7, that the high priest is still receiving the tithe today. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you, oh God, that you are receiving the tithes and the offerings that are coming in, into the storehouse. Father, we thank you that on the earth, a man would receive them, a man such as myself, but there in heaven, Christ is receiving them. Now, Father, we give you all of the praise. I thank you for the great prosperity for your people. I thank you for financial wisdom. I thank you for biblical wisdom, the highest wisdom of all, operating in the lives of your people. I thank you for debt-free lives. I thank you for setting them debt-free. I thank you for great overflow. I thank you for blessing them, just like you did Abraham, so that they can be a blessing. Now, Father, we thank you. We celebrate you, O God. In the name of Jesus, we all pray, agree, and say amen. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Praise God forever. Glory to God. Now, today, I want to talk about prophetic mental imagery. Glory to God. Take your finger and point it at your head just for a moment and say that with me. Say prophetic mental imagery. And I believe that today by the Spirit, you will prophetically see some things and the wisdom of God is going to touch your mind and the mind of Christ will begin to flow in you. Even even today as we're uh, uh, talking and sharing with God's Word, I believe solutions will come to you in areas where you need some answers. Praise God. Heavenly Father, as we jump into your Word, 
We ask that your Holy Spirit would move just like he moved over the earth when it was without form and without, it was void and it was dark. But I thank you, O oh God, that you can move by your spirit today. Let your spirit move, bringing light, bringing understanding of what we should do. Thank you, Father, that you're going to walk your people out of any tough situation. You're going to walk them right out of it into a place of peace and victory. We thank you, O oh God. We give you all of the praise in Jesus' name. And together we say, amen. Hallelujah. Let me begin today by saying that God is a spirit. You know, when I was young, uh, a question in Bible school, you know, this was when we were at church. Uh, this was the young people's Bible class. So, you know, we were maybe like second grade, fourth grade, uh, you know, first graders. Or, and so just a young, young people. And a question was posed to the teacher, what does God look like? The response was, well, we're, we're not really sure. Maybe God looks like a water vapor. Maybe he's like a, a cloud with no shape or form. But my friends, uh, that was incorrect information that was given to us because we can see that God has a form. Uh, we hear in Scripture about the hand of God, and we see about the face of God and many other things. But we need to know also that God is a spirit, and he's not just... Uh, I've heard it said wrongly sometimes that God is spirit. Well, that goes back to like the imagery again of like a foggy cloud, like uh, uh, like a blob, like what is spirit? That's like, no, no, he's not spirit. He is a spirit. Mm. God is a spirit and he made man, you and I, in his image. So man is essentially a spirit possessing a soul and dwelling in a body. Now, when man fell in sin there in the Garden of Eden, he was disconnected from the life of God. That was a sad day, wasn't it? The spirit part of man that made it possible for him to make contact with God was now dead. See, when Adam and Eve, of course, sinned in the garden, it's not like they fell over and died physically. They kept on living for a long, long time, although the moment they sinned, they actually begin to experience the aging effects. And eventually, death did kill them. Now, death is an enemy. If they had not sinned, they would have kept on living indefinitely. But they did. So what actually died in them when they sinned? Their spirit did. Their spirit died. And they went from a living spirit to now they are a spirit, uh, but their spirit has de is now dead, although they're in a still a physical body and they still have their soul, but their spirit is now dead. Mm -mm. Praise God. Praise God. The spirit part of him that made it possible for him to make contact with God was now dead. Man began then to operate only as a two-dimensional being, body and soul only. However, when Jesus was resurrected, he reconnected us. As many as believe in him, he reconnected us back to God. In other words, we were born again. The, the, dead, the deadness, the sin nature of the old man died and was done away with. And now we on the inside in our spirit have been born again. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The spirit man that had been dead was made alive, alive, alive again. Hallelujah. You have a, you have a born again spirit. Woo. Praise God. Now look at this in first Corinthians chapter 15. Thank you, Jesus. Let's drop down to verse 45. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam became a living being. So God breathed into Adam, came alive. Okay. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. I like how Paul calls or identifies Jesus as being the last Adam. The first Adam was born or created, we should say, into a perfect, beautiful world. But he allowed sin to come in. He sinned himself. But the last Adam got it right. Jesus never yielded to temptation, and he became a life-giving spirit. In other words, he has, he has the ability to give eternal life to anyone who receives him through faith. Praise the Lord. So, 
You are born again, and you are now made a living spirit. The, commu- the In other words, the communication line between you and God has been reestablished. And in order for the wisdom of God to flow so that prophetic, pure, prophetic Holy Spirit imagery can begin to come up on the image screen of your mind, what you can do in order to facilitate that is to link up your spirit with the Holy Spirit. And thus, you're able to draw out the deep secrets from God himself, and those secrets, those answers, will bring solutions to any trouble areas or even even crisis areas in your life. Praise the Lord. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, when it's talking about man here, or in the Greek, anthropos, Sometimes you hear about in college or university, uh, you must take uh, anthropology. What is that? That's the study of man. But that is always uh, anthropos used in the description of man that is not saved and, and does not know God. I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Well, My friends, the unveiling of all of these plans begins at salvation. It begins with the new birth experience, and that's when you really begin to find out what God has prepared for you, and it is unveiled through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And he takes those things and he reveals them to you so that you can know God's plan for your life and so that you can also know solutions to troubles or problems or just, um, uh, how can we say, uh, tough areas where you need solutions. Mm -mm. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Supernatural wisdom is available for our taking But first, it requires us to sit down and have the Bible with us and have books that are relevant to the area of our need, and then we can begin to read the Bible, read these illuminated books, meditate on God's Word, and begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will begin to give us the insight that that we're needing. Look at this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, and verse 28. Jesus said, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Well, my friends, the Holy Spirit, when you begin to allow the wisdom from the word that he'll bring to you when it begins to flow into your life. Um, The days of you being mocked and made fun of, maybe because of being sincere but still making wrong mistakes, maybe having good intent but still you, you made a wrong move, those days of mockings, it'll be over with. The Holy Spirit will completely dry that up in your life as the oil of the wisdom of God's word begins to touch and affect your mind. Your situation, it does have a solution by the wisdom of God. And all you have to do is apply yourself to the demands of the word, engage the help of the Holy Spirit, and you'll start to walk out of any hardship, out of any dark room. When I say a dark room, I'm not even necessarily referring to sin, although if you're in sin, that's also how you walk out. But uh, darkness sometimes in Scripture is a reference to lack of knowledge. You want to do the right thing, but you genuinely don't know what the right thing to do is. Mm. But the Holy Spirit is going to illuminate the wisdom 
the Word of God that you need to apply in the particular situation that you're facing. Right now, say, I'm coming out. This thing cannot hold me down. Say that. Say, this thing cannot hold me down. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's jump over the verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? I mean, does God need help with math? Uh, does God get stuck when he's expanding the ever-expanding universe and say, you know what, I, I, I think I, bung I bungled a few numbers. Uh, let me call a few people at the university and see if they can help me out. No, no, God doesn't need any kind of instruction on anything. I saw where they were planning on doing some uh, special things with the, uh, with the CERN, the C-E-R-N. It's this uh, giant uh, accelerator and my brother almost went to work there uh, some years back. He's a, a very brilliant physicist. Uh, didn't take the job. He wanted more of an outdoor type life. He likes the outdoors. <laughs> uh, but they're planning on doing some things. Uh, the CERN is during the eclipse because they need certain settings in order to speed things up faster and smash atoms and do all of the stuff that they do there. A lot of mysterious things, a lot of leading science things, but to God, uh, to God, it's still just like one plus one. It's all, it's all silly to God. It's all so easy and simple. <laughs> He's way, way beyond. So for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we Christians, believers, we have the mind of God. Now that's something very, very heavy to meditate on. And it's very, very true. Let me say this. Every car or truck or whatever kind of vehicle it is, it has a seat. Now, my stepson, a uh, wonderful young man, beautiful children, beautiful family, and uh, serving God in ministry, just sent me a picture to uh, me and Pastor Kelly. He just got his new Tesla truck, the cyber truck, I guess they call it. He's all excited. He got it about two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in California, but even in California, everybody was kind of like wanting to get their picture taken in front of it. But it's still the same. It doesn't matter if it's gas or if it's electric or whatever it is, it's going to have seats inside of the vehicle. Every vehicle is designed to accommodate a particular number, uh, number of people. And, you know, also you want to give comfort to the passengers, make some nice, comfortable chairs. But the seat of a vehicle plays a vital role in the functionality and also, uh, you know, just the comfort of the people on the inside of the vehicle. But let me say this, in a very similar way, wisdom also needs a place. It just needs a place to sit. Mm -hmm. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Where does wisdom, well, Pastor Stephen, I guess I'm supposed to have wisdom. You are. Where, where does it sit at? Does it sit on your arm? <laughs> Does it rest on top of your foot? No. No. The mind, okay, put your finger right here, point to your mind. The mind is the seat of wisdom. That's where wisdom sits at. Mm, 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 praise God. So before you were born again, you had a natural mind. The mind of the sinner that can be very, very creative and doing wrong things. That's the natural mind. But after we gave our lives to Jesus, the old things passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And now we have the mind of Christ. So the mind that you have now is what God calls a sound mind. That's why it's not arrogance or pride. It's not false humility, but when you have a sound mind, there's just some things you don't accept. Why? You have a sound mind. You're not a fruitcake. And if they serve, let's say they serve something to you and it's awful, I'm not going to eat it. Uh, th something's really wrong with the food. Uh, did, was this sitting back there in the kitchen too long? Was, is this the leftover meatloaf from two weeks ago? <laughs> I'm not going to eat it. I'm going to send it back. And I'm going to let them know, oh, Pastor Stephen, that's rude. You should just eat it. Just, you know, no, no, I'm not going to. Why? I have a sound mind. I, I don't want to get sick. Well, we just, just pray over it and eat it anyhow. Well, I, I am going to pray over it, 
But if something's off, uh, no, uh, I'm not going to eat it. Praise the Lord. Praise God. A sound mind uh, will give you a backbone and say, uh, no, I don't think I want to lay down on the dirt and sleep on the dirt. Well, now, Pastor Jesus, uh, Pastor Stephen, Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Well, ho hold on a minute. Are you telling me that he did that every night? He didn't have anywhere to lay his head and just slept on the ground every night? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, when, when a couple of John's disciples uh, came up to Jesus and he said, Master, where, they said, Master, where are you staying at? He didn't say, right here. I sleep on the ground right here every night. That rock, that's my pillow. Yep. Those crickets, those are my friends that sing me to sleep every night. No, he didn't say that. He said, come see. Come see where I'm living at. Well, Pastor Stephen, that would refer to, he, he had a house. Y yes. Yes, some theologians actually think it's possible, very, very possible, that he could have had two. Mm -hmm. Sound mind. Sound mind says there's something wrong with living out underneath the rain, getting rained on and getting sunburned in the summer. Well, why don't we build a roof or uh, why don't we construct something with four walls? Better yet, why don't we construct something of a floor so that we don't have to lay on the dirt? Mm -mm. A sound mind. That's why anybody that's homeless, if you stay like that for too long, uh, you, you get completely out of the phase of a sound mind. Why? It's not normal to live on the street. When I see a homeless person, I have a lot of compassion. A lot of compassion. I, I know what that's like. But at the same time, I know some things now that I didn't know back then. I know a lot of things now that I, I didn't know back then. I also know what is said in the book of Proverbs, that he who refuses instruction will experience poverty and shame. Poverty and shame comes to the person who refuses an instruction. So when I see a homeless person, I feel compassion and sometimes I help. But I also know that when I see a homeless person, I'm looking at a person somewhere in some way who has refused an, instru an instruction and will not follow it. Mm, and I've talked to a lot of homeless people. I can get them off the street just like that. And here come the excuses, blah, 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 blah. And you, you know, so it, uh, what's going on? They don't have a sound mind. Mm. Now they can say, I don't like being here. Uh, but to walk them out of that in many ways, there's needs to be healing. And of course, if there's drug addiction and things like that, there's a lot of other things that can be involved. But you... You don't have a natural mind anymore. You, you, it's not like you, you're you going to fall apart. No, because you are a believer and a child of God, you now have what God describes as being a sound mind. You should be the rock that other people look to, especially the unbelievers. When when Sutton, when when some uh, something comes that's uh, bigger uh, than what people can handle, let's say like an earthquake, because you have a lot of atheists. They're really, they're really calm, cool, and collected. You've know, got a lot of sinners, and uh, they, uh, they can be real nice people, whatever. But when you're looking at facing death, suddenly, suddenly those people who don't know God, they can have some very, very bizarre reactions, but not you. Why? You have a sound mind that actually can even be looked at as being a supernatural mind. Why? It's not natural. It's not natural to be that solid to be that sound. Mm -mm -mm. Glory to God. The mind of Christ is a sound mind, which is what you now possess. Look at this in the book of Genesis chapter 1, because I see you uh, doing similar type things. Genesis 1 verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. It was very good. So God took a mess. He took darkness and brought in light. In other words, he began to do his thing. And the way that God did all of that was, of course, he spoke it into existence. But if you're going to speak something, you have to have in mind what it is you're going to speak. And God was able to visualize what he wanted to do, and he did it. And the mind of God gave shape to what was once a shapeless, void, dark world. And you have the same type of mind as God does.
So your mind is the seat of wisdom, and you can use it to give shape to the life that you want to live. Thank you, Jesus. The mind you possess is not common, but it's very peculiar. And you can therefore produce uncommon and very peculiar results. Woo, glory to God. There's tremendous potential in what we're talking about today. And I believe you're going to turn it loose. I'm going to show you how also. Your mind is the compass of your destiny. It gives direction to your life. Again, take your finger, point it at your mind. Mm -mm. We're working with the mind of Christ wisdom today. The mind is where you weigh matters out. It's what you use to mull over situations, think over issues, analyze and reason what are the next steps that you're going to take in your life in order to arrive at the place that you want to go. Mm -mm. Your mind is responsible for the storage of memories and also for creating prophetic mental imagery. Mm -mm. In other words, you're creating a mental picture of a desired end. You can see the end before you've ever even dug the first uh, shovel load of dirt out of the ground. You can see the end of going off uh, you, let, let's say you want to go to medical school. So you go th all through college. Before you take that first class, you can already see the end, which is what? You being a leading surgeon. You being a celebrated doctor. Praise God. You can see that when you open your first book on the first day of college. Now, you're still years out, maybe 12 years out, but you can already see it. Woo, prophetic mental imagery. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Your mind allows you to paint a picture of your desired result, and it supplies you with the inner energy to accomplish it. Because when your, your passion, when what it is that you're seeing begins to move forward, oh, I tell you what, it makes you want to get out of bed in the morning and hit the floor running. Praise God. Let's go back to the book of Genesis again, uh, chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, and look at verses 5 and 6. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Now, I know that some people think that they were trying to just build higher and higher and higher, like build a tower up into the heavens, so to speak. That, in a sense, is not what they were trying to do. They were building an astronomical observatory tower. They wanted to get as high up as possible so that they could study the stars planetary systems, the galaxies, they had huge interest in astronomy. And when you think about the Magi that came to see the infant child Jesus, they were scholars in this area. Mm -mm. So God's going to come down and check it out. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Any assignment or mission can be accomplished once those who are interested can catch a mental picture of the end result of where this thing is going to end up at. And that's what President Kennedy did decades back. He was able to cast the vision to the American people that America would be the first to put a man on the moon. And it was a gigantic, very complex uh, challenge. It required many, many scientists and engineers. It kind of reminds me of the, the CEO of a Cessna airplane. Uh, he, one time he stepped back and he looked at one of the planes that had just come out of production. And he said, well, it's pretty amazing what 3,000 engineers can do. 3,000 engineers all coming together to create one plane that can fly, that can fly gracefully and be very economical and, you know, save a businessman or a businesswoman or a minister a lot of time. Praise God. My friends, there's these giant projects. Even now, America has the vision to put a man on Mars. And you know what? 
It's going to happen. The Lord actually came to me one time in a vision and told me America will be the first to put a man on Mars. Praise God. And I believe it. And it's already unfolding. And so America, to a degree, has cast that vision. And you have a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, giving everything they can, all of their mental ability and all of their effort and heart to see that it's going to happen. So any assignment or mission can be accomplished once those who are interested can catch a mental picture of the desired end, what it is you're wanting to do. Praise God. So this is what you do. When you locate a treasure in God's word and you create a mental picture of it in your mind, no matter how impossible it may seem, you can have it. So this is how you bring the wisdom in. Wisdom is forming the picture in your mind. Okay, again, now you're going to draw the wisdom from the word. You're going to draw the wisdom from godly, biblical, inspirational books that you use to shed light on the word. And you're going to take that wisdom and you're going to form the picture in your mind. You have the mind of Christ. So you're going to form that picture, that mental picture. And then you're going to translate that picture into goals that you can step by step accomplish. Because Rome, as big and beautiful as it is, wasn't built overnight. A very simple, maybe a little bit of a silly statement, but how true it is. It was not built overnight. So your great vision, the great thing that you want to accomplish, and it's probably not as complex is building a giant tower like they were trying to do there in Babel. It's probably not that complex. You probably don't need 10,000 people. You may not need 3,000 engineers. You may not be trying to put uh, somebody on the planet Mars. But whatever your thing is, as you draw wisdom from the Word, and as you read books uh, that are written by godly men and women that inspire you in that field or in that area, same area of interest that, that has caught your attention, that wisdom from the word swirling in your mind, uh, mixing with the power of the Holy Spirit will allow the Holy Spirit to hover over your understanding. Just like he hovered over the darkness, hovered over the waters, the Holy Spirit will hover over your mind and you'll you'll begin to see, you'll begin to see and hear what God has for you. And then wisdom also, the same wisdom, the same wisdom will show you logical steps of how to carry it out. Well, Pastor Stephen, the whole thing is just too overwhelming. That's why you have to always use the wisdom to know how to take it step by step by step. And there's always a next step you can do. Now, this is what happens. Sometimes people go out, they go out on the first initial step, which is, which is good, okay? You go out on the first initial step, and maybe you get a quote. And when you hear the number, you're like, oh, no way, just, just forget it. I knew it was a wild idea. I never really, you know, I, I thought God was in it, but, you know, I just, I don't know now. Well, what you have to do is when there seems to be a setback, or when there seems to be a blockage, remember the wisdom of God can resolve that area. And so many times the wisdom of God is go get another quote from somebody else. Oh, no, you don't understand, Pastor Stephen. Uh, they gave me the best quote, yet they gave you their best quote. But that doesn't mean somebody over here might not be willing uh, or might be willing to do it for a whole lot less. Maybe, maybe they're at a place where they really need the work and they'd be willing to, and maybe they're a smaller operation and maybe they can do it for one third the price, but you'll never know if you don't exercise further wisdom to, to keep asking, ask, seek, knock. Well, Pastor Stephen, this is what the doctor said. Well, we're always going to rely on what Dr. Jesus said as the highest, uh, uh, doctor's, uh, you know, determination of what is going on here. Praise God. By the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. And at the same time, if the doctor can do some things to, uh, as you mix your faith, sometimes with medicine, you know what? 
uh, maybe you need another opinion and maybe you can go to another doctor and that doctor, instead of just trying to prescribe something to you to uh, put another, like, how can we say, put a Band-Aid over it, maybe you can find a good doctor who'd be more interested in the cure because North American medicine is not interested in curing you. Why? Because if you're cured, they can't make any more money off of you, <laughs> right? You've left, you're gone. <laughs> but if they can keep treating you and keep prescribing more and more drugs and more and more medicine to you, well, you're, you're, you're making them rich. But if you're healed, you do not need their services anymore. Now, you might need them, you know, initially for something. And uh, okay, we thank God for that. Praise the Lord. But uh, hospitals are not a place you want to be hanging out at. It's just not a good place to be. You, you want to be hanging out with the Lord in a, in a healthy zone, <laughs> not a dying zone. Mm, mm, mm. Praise God. So when you locate a treasure in God's Word, and you will as you're meditating on the Word, as you locate a treasure in God's Word, and you create a mental picture of it in your mind, no matter how impossible it may seem, you can have it. You can bring it to pass. Mm, mm. So, Allow the wisdom of God to form it. And then with the wisdom of God, begin to uh, uncover the steps. You know, when King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings there in Egypt, Howard Carter, the man that discovered it, uh, the previous year when he was looking for it, he came within 30 inches of it. And he, he didn't find it. But the next year when he found it, and, the, and he uncovered those steps leading down into it because everybody told him, oh, there's, there's no more uh, tombs that have not been uh, plundered. They've all been plundered. Even if there's one we haven't found, it's been plundered too. He goes, no, I think this one's been preserved. They, they all said, oh, no, 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 they've all been plundered. He goes, no, I think this one's good. I just can't find it. Kept looking and looking. And who would have thought he was only 30 inches away from it. And then the following year, he found it. So he had an image of himself finding that. But we can have kingdom images of things that bring glory and honor to the Lord, of businesses that can operate on state, national, even international scales, of things that you can do where you can break through, break out, praise God, and make your world beautiful. You can have your own Garden of Eden, praise God, working with the wisdom of God. It's like a scientist going into a laboratory and having all these rare earth minerals and elements to play with and to work with. And well, uh, we've seen that they can make some amazing things out of that, but you can make some amazing things as you sit down with God's word, which is the wisdom of God and draw from it and source from it and read inspirational Christian literature and let it light your heart on fire. And there's no telling what you'll create. I've got a question for you uh, today. How come people don't play golf in the ghetto? How come you never see anybody uh, wearing golf clothes and uh, standing out on a, uh, you know, like a rundown graf graffitied street with uh, g garbage and trash thrown all over the place? How come nobody's over there trying to put a little ball into a hole? <laughs> you know, the reason people play golf and the reason golf is so successful is because it's framed in beauty. And the game itself is very technical and can be very frustrating. You're trying to get that little ball into a little tiny hole and you're trying to swing a club and you can't grab it like a bat because if you could grab it like a baseball bat, now you can use force and power, but you can't really use it the way you have to grab it. So it's, it's a very technical game, but because it's played in a, be a beautiful place, People flock to it. But see, you can make your world beautiful. Uh, oh, Pastor Stephen, I just got a little tiny backyard. It's only like 40 by 40 square feet. It's not very big. Yeah, but that, that can be your little Garden of Eden back there. Wow. You know, I uh, I sat one time in a solarium. It was, it was beautiful. It was uh, watered like in a way where there was a mist going up all the time. It was at a university that I used to attend. And before going into the class, I would sit inside of that building, that solarium, solarium, or whatever you call it, and I would read my Bible for like 15 or 20 minutes, and 
Uh, there was a friend of mine that went to church. We were in the in the youth group together, the college youth group, and uh, he was uh, paid every day to go in there and water all the plants. So there's greenery everywhere and banana trees growing, and it was just like a it was almost like the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and you could be in the middle of winter, and it's maybe 15 degrees outside, and you go in there and it's just utter moisture. Everything's uh, whoo, it's just it's just amazing. It's like that year round. But you know, whatever it is, it makes you happy. Because uh, if you live in the North Pole, but you're thinking, you know, I, uh, God's called me to live here, but, you know, I, I kind of like South Florida. Well, you can make South Florida there in the North Pole. Just build it, you know, but you've got to be able to see it here. You got to, and then if you see it and you want to do it, then you've got to find a place to put it, <laughs> which could be kind of difficult over there. But But if you really want it, you can have it. So you can have the world that you want, but it must be be drawn out of the wisdom of God, and it must be corresponding with your calling in life because there are a million different directions you can go in, but you want to go in the direction that God has for you. Praise God. Now, right now, even as I'm talking, the Holy Spirit is hovering over your head, hovering over your mind, and you're beginning to think some thoughts. Maybe you haven't thought like this in quite some time. Maybe you've been depressed or discouraged or or maybe you kind of just gave up on some original thoughts. But the Holy Spirit is hovering right now, and the creative anointing is working upon your mind right now. And it's time to move ahead with a new project. Or if there was a kingdom project, you put it on the shelf because you couldn't find a way forward. It's time to revisit that and sit down and think with the Bible, with books, and just hang out with God, and the Holy Spirit will show you how to get the first phase knocked out. Woo! Glory to God. Now, on our 14.5 acres, right next to the beautiful airport here in our county, we have taken the land through two phases of development. We're about to go into phase three. We're a few weeks out, and all of the bulldozers and all of the uh, heavy equipment, uh, the excavators, and all of the other stuff will be showing up. And so, in my life, I have to know what we want before they ever get there. I just can't say, well, just start pushing dirt around and whatever makes you happy. Uh, no, you have to have a plan. The building, the new television studio and ministry headquarters is now in phase three Woo! of revisions. We've gone through two phases of revisions. We're in the final phase. After that, it's just small tweaking, this and that, small things. But it requires planning, and that's why you need the wisdom of God. Why? So that you can create it and make it the way that God, with his creative nature, has put that in you and you can express, you can express and create the way that you want to under the anointing and leading of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. I've got, a, I've got the book on my shelf. I've mentioned it before. The book called Ugly as Sin. It's a book about whatever happened to beautiful church buildings. How come some of the modern-day church buildings are so ugly-looking? You know why? Because most of the modern-day churches are designed by atheists. <laughs> yes, atheistic architectural firms that are supposed to sit down, and they, with their dead minds, although they may be really good on paper, it, you know, uh, engineering something, but they're supposed to create something that will glorify God. Well, my friends, that's why a lot of the buildings are looking as hideous as they are. So we need to create things that make people feel like, you know, I come here, I feel like I want to pray. Glory to God. You know, I feel, I come here, I feel like I want to sit down and read my Bible for an hour. Mm -hmm. Woo, hallelujah. But before you ever move the dirt, before you ever build build it, you you got to know what you're going to build. And that, uh, you know, we, we've expanded the pad site that we're going to build on, excuse me, we're going to expand it because we made the TV studio a little bit larger. Amen. That way, that way, when you come as a guest, when you say, Pastor Stephen, I want to come and sit in on a live recording. Well, there'll be room for you mm -hmm. and, and some other things that you can do while you're on the property to relax. Praise the Lord. After all, I don't want you to have to walk to the forest and eat acorns. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make your trip enjoyable. We'll make your stay nice. Praise God. But I'll be casting that vision in much more detail 
once the uh, the renderings for the new building are finished. And uh, but either way, uh, in about in about three weeks, a lot of dirt going to be moved. Praise the Lord. The prayer area is going to be raised up. An outdoor prayer altar, mm, the glory portal, where you can come and pray and let the Holy Spirit move. And don't blame me. Don't blame me if you have your own uh, uh, translation uh, uh, experience like Philip did, caught up, ministering, taken away in the Spirit. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's going to be quite a place. Outdoors, on a raised platform, in the middle of a forest. <laughs> Woo! Amen. You don't have to be a copycat. Do it, do, the way every, uh, do it the way everybody else does it. Do what God has called you to do. Mm-hmm. Let God work through you to put a unique stamp uh, that people say, wow, I've never seen it done like that before. That's pretty, that's pretty wild. Praise God. I release the new creative anointing upon your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, it reminds me of what Mr. Dassault said. He was the founder of uh, the Sojet. Many people call it the Salt, but it's a French name, so we'll just say Dassault and the Falcon Jet Corporation. He said, in order for a plane to fly good, in order for a plane to perform good, he said it should look good. <laughs> if it doesn't look good, you're, something's already wrong. Even, even aerodynamically, even mathematically, if the plane looks stupid, some, something's wrong. <laughs> it should look good. <laughs> I think that's true for everything in life. Amen. Amen. Now, you need to go and create something beautiful. Go wash all of those dirty dishes and make your kitchen uh, look better. Hallelujah. Go make the unmade bed that hasn't been made in three weeks. Praise God. Put your life in a beautiful order. Let the wisdom of God flow. Well, Pastor Stephen, I got an old car. Who cares anyhow? No, clean the old car. Get ready for the new car. Vacuum the old car. Shine the tires. Hallelujah. Who knows? Maybe somebody will walk up to you, just give you a cash offer for it. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Make room. Make room for the new. Make room right here for the new. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are watching. Let the creative anointing, the mind of Christ, touch them now. We thank you. We thank you in Jesus' name. This is the wisdom era of the church. This is the wisdom era of the church. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Now, if you're watching and you don't know Jesus, I want you to do the wisest thing that you could ever do, ever, which is to receive eternal life because hell is real and I don't want you to go there. And God loves you so much that he sent his son to go through untold anguish to make redemption available for you. He was scourged, hung on a cross, crucified to pay the penalty for the sins of humanity, that anyone who would put their faith and trust in Jesus can be saved. If you haven't done that, do the wisest thing in the universe. Pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. You were raised on the third day and you are seated with God in heaven. Lord Jesus, I repent of all of my sins. Save me right now. Wash me with your precious blood. Write my name in your book of life and step into my life. And from this day forward, lead me and guide me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for washing my sins away. In your name I pray. Amen. Woo! And amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family of God. Praise the Lord. That was the wisest thing you could have ever done. Mm -mm. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, praise God. Praise the Lord. Now, my friends, let's continue to operate in the wisdom of God by taking Holy Communion. Grab some unleavened bread and some grape juice. We're going to walk in the wisdom of God, which is to walk in the wisdom of the Word. And in the early church, they took the communion when they would meet. Sometimes they were taking it every day. But we do know that they were taking it on the first day of the week, and we're going to take it also. 
So I want you to take communion with me. We don't just take it on Easter, Resurrection Day. Uh, the, you know, the word Easter is not in the Bible. I know it's in there once in the KJV, but <laughs> that's uh, not, not the best translation, of course. Easter is an old world, old word coming from the word Ishtar, one of the ba- Babylonian idols that were worshipped and so forth. So I, prim- I primarily stick with the Resurrection Day, which is always technically connected with Passover. Okay, that's that's long story short. We'll save that for another message. But today... We are taking communion, and we pretty much take it every time we're together. I want to encourage you to do that as well. So grab some unleavened bread, grab a little cracker, grab your grape juice, and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread and the juice. And through this prayer, we bless it and set it apart as being holy. And we thank you that while we still see bread and juice, we thank you that this is now the body and the blood of Christ under the hidden, veiled form of bread and grape juice. So, Father, as we now receive the Lord's flesh, we just thank you for wisdom flowing, the mind of Christ. We thank you that we have a sound mind, not a silly mind, not a goofy, foolish mind. Father, we have a sound mind, a joyful mind, yes, but a sound mind that's never panicked, or stressed. Oh God, we give you all of the praise. We now receive the Lord's flesh. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. Amen. Praise the Lord. Maybe you've seen some things in the past. Maybe you've had some things done to you in the past that, as they would say, warped your mind. As a child of God, you've been redeemed from that. You are delivered from that. You must confess, believe, and accept that you have a sound mind. Hallelujah. Now, we still have memory. Unless God supernaturally takes the memory away. Sometimes he does that, but sometimes he doesn't because he doesn't need to. It's nothing but burn up ashes. That's all it is. It can't hurt you at all. Mm -mm. I see such a sound mind coming into you that should even the devil try to trouble you in your dreams at night with a bad dream, even in your dream, you're going to start talking back to the devil and say, no, no, I don't receive that. I have a sound mind. I'm healed. <laughs> You'll wake up and, have, and realize you just got had a, had a dream and you, you rebuke the devil in the dream. Praise God. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, his mighty victorious power imparted into us through his new life placed into us upon our salvation. We thank you, Father God, that you can't be defeated, and because we're in you, neither can we. We thank you that all of the forces of darkness are defeated and are underneath our feet, and we embrace that if, that position. Father, let the blood do its work. Let the blood do its work. Dry up all foolishness. Dry up any silly, unbiblical ideas. Father, any wrong paths that your people would be on that are unbiblical, Let them make the turn now. Oh, God, we give you praise. We know you say in your word that horses have to have a bridle put in their mouth in order to guide them. And other types of creatures have to have almost like a hook, like a bull put with a ring in its nose in order to turn it. But Father God, we thank you that we turn at the discovery of your illuminated word without arguing, without contesting it, but just receiving it and obeying like Abraham did. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, and we thank you that we're on the right path in Christ's name. Amen. Let's receive together. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. A sound mind will also help you to maintain one of the most sacred things there is, and it's called the presence of God. But if you ever get in the panic mode, if you ever get into what some people call freak-out mode, that presence will just disappear. 
What happened? You compromised in the area of a sound mind. No matter what happens, no matter what the initial report might, might be, if you ever have one that maybe it's shocking, maybe whatever it is, hold to a sound mind, and you'll also be conscious of the Lord's presence during times like that. But if you, if you become unraveled, you'll not only lose the presence, you'll, you'll, now you're in unbelief, and that mind frame that you're supposed to hold, you've lost it. Okay, so stay in that. You have a sound mind, the mind of wisdom, the mind of Christ. Thanks for watching. Go to work, create, create with your mind the image processing of the prophetic image. Go to work on that and make your world beautiful, and it'll be a blessing to you and, of course, to many other people as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you back next time.